That's the dinner bell. All right. It's time to feed. Time to feed on God's word, right? <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, uh, thank you all for being here. We'll continue our lesson in Ecclesiastes, and uh, I'll say great. Pastor Chris, wonderful sermon as usual this morning, and uh, a lot of what Pastor Chris talked about, God's providence, uh, we're going to talk about today in our lesson, that uh, God is, uh, He often indeed is playing chess while we're playing checkers. He sees the bigger picture. Um, before we get started, uh, most of you know that uh, I'm a mechanical engineer, that's, that's, that's what I do for a living. Um, at my current job, and really throughout my whole career, I, I've dealt with like heavy equipment, machinery, and uh, in my line of work, there's a term called a, a bad actor. Anyone, can anyone have a guess of what that might mean? I'm not talking about someone uh, in a Hallmark movie. Uh, uh, what would it be? Like an insider threat? No, no. It's it, a bad actor. So, in my line of work, when, when that term is used, it's referring to a piece of equipment that keeps failing, uh, keeps causing problems, all right? And people like me in my position, oftentimes, uh, you know, will we'll track data, metrics, to identify what these bad actors are. What are the ones that are costing the company money, and, and what can we do to fix it? So, I might be tasked with going to look at a bad actor and uh, trying to figure out what the root cause of the failures are and then what can we do to prevent it from happening again. Um, so on some occasions when I've, I've done that in the past, what I'll do is I'll dig in and I'll discover that, that the equipment is being operated outside of its design envelope. In other words, the equipment is being asked to do something that it wasn't designed to do, okay? Uh, and other times, uh, maybe, I may be asked to look at a piece of equipment that maybe it's not failing, but maybe it's not performing up to expectations. And on some occasions, I may go and look at that piece of equipment and find that the expectations that are being placed on it are unrealistic. This equipment's not even capable of doing what you're expecting it to do. Uh, so the result when, we <laughs> when, uh, when equipment is used that way, outside of its design, or outside of its uh, capabilities is what? Repeated failures and, uh, and disappointment, really, unmet uh, expectations. Now, in the scenarios I just described, is the equipment the problem? No. no. The equipment itself is not the problem. The equipment can only do what it's designed to do. It can only provide what it's designed to provide. Assuming the design selection was appropriate. The problem is with the person who is operating the equipment outside of its design or placing unrealistic expectations on the equipment outside of its capabilities. You with me? Yes. <laughs> so in Ecclesiastes, Solomon is demonstrating to us the incapability of anything under the sun to provide permanent profit. That includes the labor, wisdom, knowledge, pleasure, wealth, etc. that we looked at last week. Who created and designed these things? God, God did, right? And when we pursue these things for profit under the sun as something that will last, as a foundation to stand on, some, uh, for meaning and fulfillment, as something to stake our identity in or place our hope in, Solomon calls it vanity and striving after when. Why? Because we are looking to these things to provide something that they are not designed to provide and are incapable of providing. And likewise, the results are repeated failures and disappointment. And when we do this, where does the problem lie? With the objects that are being pursued, the equipment? No. With the designer, the one who created and designed the equipment? No. The problem is with us, the ones who are misusing or placing unrealistic expectations on the equipment. It's like we are trying to mow our grass with a vacuum and being surprised and upset when it doesn't work. We shouldn't think that God doesn't want us to experience pleasure or attain wisdom and knowledge or have money. All of these things have their place. Solomon will demonstrate this in our text today. In our lesson today and throughout the book, we will see that Solomon is telling us 
to enjoy and utilize these things as God designed. Last week in our lesson, Solomon demonstrated the inability of labor, wisdom, knowledge, laughter, alcohol, accomplishments, possessions, sex, money, luxury, entertainment, and fame to provide profit under the sun. In our lesson today, Solomon will investigate further and consider these things from a different, little more somber perspective, face to face with death itself. But the night is darkest just before the dawn, and he will offer hope in the verses that follow. Can I get a volunteer to read chapter 2, verses 12 through 17? Can I say that's an amazingly good example you just gave? Well, thank you. I hope so. I kept thinking of it as I read this book, but I wasn't sure if I could communicate it effectively, because <laughs> I see it every day. Well. Great. I've already made a note to steal it. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. No problem. All right, 12 through 17, please. So I turn to consider wisdom, insanity, and foolishness. For what will the man do who will come after the king except what has already been done? Then I saw that wisdom surpasses foolishness as light surpasses darkness. The wise person's eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I know that one and the same fate happens to both of them. Then I said to myself, as if the fate, wait, as is the fate of the fool, it will also happen to me. Why then have I been extremely wise? So I said to myself, this too is futility, for there is no lasting remembrance of the wise along with the fool, since in the coming days everything will soon be forgotten. And how the wise and the fool alike die. So I hated life, for the work which had been done under the sun was unhappy to me, because everything is futility and striving after wind. Thank you, dear. Um, so, he says in verse 12, I turn to consider wisdom, madness, and folly. If you remember last week, uh, in verse 17 of chapter 1, he said, I set my mind to know wisdom and madness and folly. Here, in verse, uh, verses 12 all the way through 23, Solomon is going to tackle the same topics that he covered uh, at the end of chapter 1 all the way through the first 11 verses of chapter 2, but look at them from a different perspective. I think that's what he means when he says, I turn to consider, or I turn my thoughts to consider. He then says, for what will the man do who will come after the king except what has already been done? Here Solomon is specifically referring to his successor. Uh, what can he try that I can't? Who is better qualified than me with my wisdom and my resources? And this also clues us into the new perspective that Solomon is going to view these things. He says, after the king. Who will come after the king? That's a reference to him, to his own death. Then he says, I saw that wisdom excels folly as light excels darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. So by comparison, wisdom is more beneficial than folly. I don't think we disagree with that. Solomon compares them to walking in light and walking in darkness, basically being blinded. Uh, the wise person can see what's in front of him, see what's ahead, and prepare accordingly, whereas the fool does not consider the future or what's ahead, is called unprepared and suffers the consequences. I'll ask you guys, what are some examples of, of wisdom that, that we practice every day just practically in our lives? Think about driving. Yeah, driving I'm gonna, responsibility. I'm going to run the stop sign. I don't care. Man. Right. That would, that's a good example. We obey, obey laws, right? That's wise behavior. Uh, we, we use our money wisely. We try to. The fool doesn't. Um, what about uh, eating healthy, exercising, taking care of our bodies? Um, studying the Word of God. Studying the Word of God, absolutely. That's wise behavior. We think before we act or speak. We avoid dangerous situations like running stop signs. We work hard, we try to be good employees, all right? These are all good things, and Solomon is noting that living or acting or behaving this way is better than being foolish. Makes sense, right? But he's only setting us up to knock us down. <laughs> and he says, and yet, I know one fate befalls them both. Then I said to myself, as is the fate of the fool, it will also befall me. Why then have I been extremely wise? So I said to myself, this too is vanity. 
There are limitations to the benefits of wisdom, as death is inevitable for the wise and the foolish. Solomon thus condemns being extremely wise as vanity. He's referring to the pursuit of human wisdom as an end unto itself. And why does he feel this way? Well, it says, For there is no lasting remembrance of the wise man as with the fool. Inasmuch in the coming days all will be forgotten, and how the wise man and the fool alike die. So I hated life, for the work which had been under the, done under the sun was grievous to me, because everything is futility and striving after wind. So not only do the wise man and the fool share the same fate in death, they will also be forgotten just the same. Solomon is looking years into the future when his successor has taken over the throne and beyond. He and the fool will be no different, six feet under and forgotten. Solomon looked down on the fool during his lifetime, just like we do, but there will be no difference between them in a few decades. The result, the result is the same, dead and forgotten. Solomon acknowledges the temporary profit of acting wisely under the sun, but there is no permanent profit under the sun in human wisdom. Verse 17 is a statement of disgust after his findings. He says, I hated life. Consider a person having these thoughts at the end of his or her life. If death is the end and there is no profit under the sun, then life is to be hated. If man looks under the sun for meaning, then he will hate life because it cannot be found there. Man seeks meaning in being remembered and despairs over the thought of being forgotten. Why? Because if he is forgotten, then his life is truly meaningless if what is under the sun is all there is to life. It would make no difference in a few decades if he never existed. Solomon makes a bleak observation here that I think God has designed us to make. And if we want to be remembered, we must turn to the one who never forgets. We spend so much wasted time and effort on trying to make a name for ourselves in this world to be remembered and known by a world full of people who are just like us, who will soon also be dead and forgotten. We do so while the God of the universe extends an open hand to enter into an eternal relationship with him. And unlike man, he will never die and never forget. He says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Only in him do our lives find significance, meaning, and fulfillment, not just for our short time under the sun, but for all eternity. Amen. Any thoughts on that before we move on? Fred? It's kind of like football. You get all excited about football and all yeah. this year, and Super Bowl, who won the Super Bowl? And next year, somebody asked, who won the Super Bowl? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I had that observation recently. Our work group does like a fantasy football league, and we had kind of like a tailgate party to kick everything off. And it was fun because they did some kind of football uh, trivia. We all kind of played together. I used to know that stuff, like the back of my hand. I could tell you every NFL record, who held it. I didn't remember any of it anymore. I think that's what kids do to you as well. So yeah, your priorities change. Any other comments before we move on? Jeff. Seth, it's interesting little note here in the New Living Bible. He says, as king, Solomon had everything a person could want. He was king. But it says, but it was all, he was after a personal satisfaction. Yeah. And it says personal satisfaction by itself is empty. Yeah. Well, because we are alone in the enjoyment we receive. And then it uh, it said it should be more of a not not just all about me. Right. You know, yeah. That's, that's yeah. That's a good point. That, that we're not going to find what we're looking for. We just look within. Yep. Right. It got to look beyond ourselves. Yep. Look at all the people all down through history. You say, man, he had it all. You know. Yeah. Why, why did he do what he did? You know. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Look at Elvis. He couldn't yeah. go anywhere. Right, right. He had a, he had a, yeah. he had a front, a music car. Yeah, right, right. Good. Hey, Bob. You think Solomon had any indication of how foolish his son would be? Right We're getting to that in the next <laughs> session. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And we're going to come back to some of these verses in reference to that. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, 
pet. Or Aunt Carolyn, that's sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a note in my Bible that says, wisdom lets you see the problems, but it doesn't help you solve them. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting yeah, thought. Interesting, interesting thought. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Can I get a volunteer to read verses 18 to 23, please? I hated all my toil in which I have toiled under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool? Yet he will be a master, yet he will be master of all for which I toil and use my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes a person who is toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a grave. What has a man from all the toil and striving in the heart with, with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow and his works, work is a vexation. Even in the night, his heart does not rest. This also is bad. Thanks, David. So, here we see in verse 18 that Solomon shifts from his work under the sun to the results of his work. It says, Thus I hated the fruit of my labor, for which I labored under the sun. Why? For I must leave it to the man who will come after me. Solomon will die, and he can't take anything with him. Solomon did not find satisfaction in the fruit of his labor. And if Solomon can say this, then I think we all can. What reasons do we work? What's the fruit of our labor? Why do we go to our jobs each, each week? To eat? To eat? Yeah. What else? Yeah. Security. Uh, to buy things, possessions, to spend them on entertainment, pleasure, to pay taxes. To pay taxes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Solomon, Solomon probably got to avoid that. Um, yeah, so Solomon, he had all, all, all he wanted, right? He had all these in spades. Uh, and again, if we look to the fruit of our labor for profit under the sun, we will hate it. Why? Because it cannot give it. So not only does man not get to keep all that he has labored for because he will die, but who knows what kind of person will inherit the fruit of his labor, whether he will be wise or a fool. Solomon may be thinking here of the houses, vineyards, gardens, parks, ponds, slaves, flocks, herds, silver, and gold that he mentioned earlier in verses 4 through 8. A person may try to find meaning in the fruits of their labor by the thought or motivation of leaving it as an inheritance for their children, or if they don't have children, for the next generation. But the toil and anxiety with which we labor under the sun to accumulate wealth may not be appreciated, recognized, or used wisely by the next generation. Solomon here was speaking from personal experience but I think from both sides of this comparison. We saw late, late in life, Solomon became the son who did not act wisely with what was left him. 1 Kings 11.4 said, When Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of his da David his father had been. And by his sin, Solomon squandered what David left to him. 1 Kings 11, 11 and 12 said, The Lord said to Solomon, Because you have done this, you have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you, and I will give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father David, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. The son of Solomon that God spoke of, that Bob referenced, was Rehoboam. He succeeded Solomon, and you may know the story that he forsook the wise counsels of the elders who, who were uh, uh, counseled his father, Solomon, for the foolish advice of his buddies, the, the friends he had that he grew up with. And that led to the splitting of the kingdom of Israel, just as God foretold. So Solomon may have had Rehoboam in mind in these verses. He knew whose hands the kingdom uh, would be left in. 
Uh, and that could put new light on verse 12 when he said, What will the man do who will come after the king except what has already been done? Solomon knew Rehoboam would act foolishly with his inheritance just as he did himself. So leaving an inheritance is a good thing, okay? <coughs> Solomon says so in Proverbs 13, 22. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. But if we are pinning our hopes on the next generation, this too is vanity. Uh, do we try to find profit under the sun and leaving something behind for our children <coughs> or the next generations? That our lives will have meaning and significance if we can leave something behind that helps the next generation. Do we see that today? I think of the prodigal son. Prodigal son, yeah. He was foolish, yeah. <laughs> he squandered what was left to him. Yep, yeah. yeah. What about, uh, do we ever see parents trying to live through their children? Yeah? Why, am I, why, am I, why do parents do this? Any thoughts? Because they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it, yeah, yeah. Sometimes I think maybe they're trying to atone for their mistakes, right? By, by living through their children. I think so, that's a relevant uh, topic there. How would you uh, characterize the wisdom that God gave to Solomon when he asked what anything, he could have anything, he gave him wisdom, is it? Yeah. Only God, was it godly wisdom? Was it yes. earthly wisdom? It is God, godly wisdom, but uh, I think acting wisely, like, like the things we talked about earlier, human wisdom can involve saving money, eating healthy, all those things. There's probably some overlap there. Um, but, but when he talks about under the sun, he's limiting his perspective to just human wisdom. <clears throat> Only what is wise for life here on earth excluding that which is above the sun. Does that make sense? Yeah, because it, it gives you the feeling that he's only talking about what happens until he dies. He that's right. doesn't take in the fact that we don't live until that's, we die. That's until right. We, until we die, well, then we really start to live. That, that, that's, that's exactly what he's doing. Okay. Yeah, yep, absolutely. So what's the answer to all of this? Well, we need to have a correct theology of work. Someone read verses 24 through 26, please. A person can do nothing better than to eat, drink, and find satisfaction in their own quarrel. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without Him, who can eat or find enjoyment? To the person that pleases Him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, He gives a task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too is me. <coughs> and chasing after the wind. Thank you, Bob. All right. I don't know if you caught it there, but there's some good news. Okay. Um, so Solomon concludes that what is best, he says nothing better, it comes from the hand of God and it only from God. For who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him? Joy is not possible from God, apart from God, just as food and provision are not a possible apart, apart from God. The ability to enjoy our lives is a gift from God. And when we are living for these other things, we rob ourselves of joy. Uh, Solomon does not urge us to accept this in a fatalistic manner, but as truth and live in light of this truth. He acknowledges that there is joy and hope available to man, but only in God. And what does he say is best? Eat, drink, Enjoy your work. There's a sense of living here with a proper perspective of the inevitabilities of life and things out of our control. Carpe diem, seize the day, grasp the present. But this does not mean let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Remember the final conclusion that Solomon provides at the end of his message. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Why? For God shall bring every work into judgment and with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Judge, judgment is coming. Recognize the gifts God has given and enjoy them as He designed unto His glory. And eating, drinking, and working are not extraordinary things, right? These are normal, everyday tasks that Solomon concludes are gifts from God that are to be a source of joy. Before the fall, Adam and Eve enjoyed their work 
because it was a gift given by God for their joy and His glory. Let's put ourselves in uh, Adam's shoes. After he sinned, God cursed the ground. Uh, what do you think Adam thought whenever he toiled and struggled with the ground to provide food for his survival? I imagine he remembered what his work was like beforehand. He remembered the joy he used to receive from his work in Eden. Adam's futile toil served as a reminder that the joy he received did not come from his labor or the fruit of his labor, but it came from the God who gave it. God wants man to look to him for meaning, fulfillment, contentment. And what God gives is all we need to live and live abundantly and joyfully. Any thoughts on that before we move on? Bob? It's funny when you read that, you realize even today, the knowledge that is above that you talked about is the hardest knowledge to pass on to your children. Yeah. Um, it's really, if you look at the, at the stats today about how many children stop, stop coming to church. Yeah. And that's that wisdom and love that you're talking about that's so hard to pass on. Right, to absolutely. Yeah. A good inheritance doesn't include just wealth, <laughs> right? Uh, it's, it, it's more than that. Right. Yeah. There's a part in here that doesn't seem true. Set. Right? Where it says, <clears throat> but to the sinner he is given the business of gathering and collecting, yeah. only to give to one who pleases God. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that doesn't seem true. Yeah. I, but I think the, 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 the concept you brought out, judgment. Yeah. There is a point at which <clears throat> this, this is true. Yeah, right? amen. Like, That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, I love it. That's awesome because I, I was about to cover that verse. And, <laughs> and no, and I mean it because uh, I'd much rather the pastor <laughs> cover it before I do. <laughs> he has a better perspective. <laughs> but that's absolutely right. And that's a tough one to, uh, we'll get to it here in a second, but it's not always true in terms of uh, life here on earth. But, but you're right. Good. So the, the verse he's referencing, uh, verse 26. Uh, first of all, he says, a person to his good, who is good in his sight. Um, are any of us good in God's sight? No. Don't let that confuse you. Um, the word there for good, that's the same word he uses for pleasure uh, earlier in chapter 2. In chapter 7, verse 26, uh, Solomon, he does a similar comparison. He compares the sinner to one who is pleasing to God, and he uses that same Hebrew word. So the same thought applies here. The one who is good in his sight, this is one who is pleasing to God. One who fears God and obeys his commandments. And in verse 20 of chapter 7, he also says, Indeed, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and never sins. So God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to the one pleasing to him. Uh, these blessings are withheld from the sinner, or one who is not pleasing to God. Uh, the sinner is not able to enjoy his work or the wealth he may accumulate. He remains stuck in the rat race. In some cases, God may give the sinner riches to those who are pleasing to him. So I read Proverbs 13, 22 a minute ago, uh, but I did not finish the verse. It says, A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. The comparison in this proverb is helpful. The good man leaves an inheritance behind, but what happens to the wealth of the sinner? He loses it. It's wise and good to leave a legacy behind for our children, not just money. By contrast, after the sinner dies, what wealth he has will likely pass into hands that know how to use it better. In 2.26, this verse we just read, what does it say the, spinner, the sinner spends his time collecting and gathering? Nothing, right? In my text, at least, there's, there's no direct object, okay? Uh, I think that might speak to this is the sinner's continuous cycle of gathering and collecting for no profit. It's vanity and striving after win. And note also that what does, God does not include wealth in what he gives to the one who is good in the sight. Nevertheless, the righteous are able to enjoy these blessings properly because they are not seeking meaning from them. And the point of this verse is not that Christians should labor more to try and earn God's favor, in order to receive whatever it is the sinners are gathering and collecting. That's the complete opposite of the point uh, he, is, he is making here. 
The point is that God blesses those who please Him, while those who don't are stuck in the cycle of gathering and collecting without ever enjoying the fruit of their labor. Everybody good? Any comments before we move on? All right. Fred. We see evil people that prosper. Yeah. And I know there's somewhere in the you know, Bible that says something about that. You know. Yeah, Solomon says that. Judgment's coming. Yeah. But also Jesus, when he says they're, they're getting their reward in full, yeah. I always have to tell myself when I see celebrities or um, just popular people and it seems like they have such a following and um, you know I just have to tell myself they're getting their reward in full yeah. this is it so enjoy it because after this it's not you know it's going to be the consequence yeah. of that hey, I've heard people say there's a lot of uh, I don't know famous people or celebrities who clearly maybe live in a life of sin and they'll give a million dollars to charity and like, I, I think God would rather have their obedience, <laughs> you know, than, than a million dollars to charity. Steve? And the people, uh, you, know, you know, about the really ultra-rich people have more money than they know what to do with. They always want more. Yeah, yeah it's never enough. Never That's right. Kind of goes yeah. I was talking with Matt Williamson uh, after last week's class, and he brought up a good point that we today, we kind of live like kings did back then in terms of just the standard of living that, that we're used to, yet it's still, it's not enough, right? People always want more and more. Bob? One, one good example, it comes to my mind about this, was, was the Copelands. And Copelands and Copelands were actually cousins of each other. Yeah. So Billy and I got invited one Christmas to Al Copeland's Christmas. Uh, boy. So we got to see it from the inside. Mm -hmm. The funny thing you're talking about is Copeland made all his money being able to taste things and make great food. And in the end, he had cancer of the throat where he couldn't taste the food at all. Oh, and that's wow. What he died from. Wow. So it's amazing how God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Works. Absolutely. Jeff. I was just going to say, as, as children of God, we're to be good stewards. Mm -hmm. what He's, yeah. He's blessed us. Right. You know, we're supposed to love our neighbor. Well, you know, hey, given what I got to my neighbor, if, that, if that's to be a good steward, that's what we're to do. Not, oh, that's mine. I'm not going to give it. You right. Know? Right. So, that's a good observation. Thanks, Jim. <clears throat> All right. Well, let's, uh, let's move on to, uh, to chapter 3. Uh, can I get a volunteer to read verses 1 through 11? For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to t tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What gain has the worker from his toil. I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. Thank you, Hollis. Does that remind anybody of a song? <laughs> turn, turn, turn by the birds, right? Uh, in my study I came across, I think that's credited with the, the song with the oldest lyrics uh, because the lyrics are literally just plucked right from, uh, right from these verses. Uh, and yes, that song has been stuck in my head all week. And <laughs> I, can't, I can't get it out. Uh, but I guess that's not a terrible thing. It's scripture. Uh, so Solomon's, uh, this is a poem. 
here in chapter 3 uh, that, that should remind us of his opening monologue back in chapter 1. And we're going to compare these as we go through, but let's go ahead and make an observation here. Uh, the monologue in chapter 1 mostly centered around time as well, uh, but from an under-the-sun perspective. Solomon discussed the coming and going in generations, the cycles of nature, and how history repeats itself to emphasize the monotony of life and the futility of man's toil. With a sense of hopelessness, he provided an impersonal macro view of time for all humanity from the natural man's perspective on earth. Contrast that with here in chapter 3, the, per the perspective becomes hopeful and personal, and it centers on moments in an individual person's life. He says there is a season or there is an appointed time for everything, and there is a time for every event under heaven. Um, some of you may uh, have a different translation that says uh, every delight or purpose or matter under heaven. So in the New America Standard Bible, it doesn't use the word season. It uses it says appointed time, and then it says, and there is a time. Um, but those are two different Hebrew words. Um, that the word in the second half of the verse for time, the, that, that word's a more general word for time. It's more common in Scripture. The first one, though, uh, that's translated season or appointing time. Uh, we only see it three other times in Scripture. And in Nehemiah, uh, it's used to refer to a set duration of time, like a start and an end. Um, and then in Esther, it's used to refer to a specific date. So if we consider that word as a set duration of time, I think season is, is appropriate. Uh, so Solomon is saying that there are set or appointed events and seasons in each life on earth. Solomon here, he's also introducing the, the poetic structure that he's going to use in verses 2 through 8. Uh, this verse parallels them. Uh, that same conjunctive clause there, and a time, that's the exact same he uses throughout, uh, throughout those verses. And he says, every event under heaven. Uh, we've talked about this before, though, that you should consider that as uh, synonymous with under the sun. Some suggest that Solomon uses under heaven here because he's taking more of a divine view. Um, I do think he is taking more of a divine view. I don't necessarily know that under heaven means that. Uh, we've seen him use under heaven twice already, and uh, both times clearly support, support uh, the same use as under the sun. And although God is not mentioned in verse 1, the context of the remaining verses makes clear that Solomon has God in view. He is acknowledging God's sovereignty over the earth, over every event under heaven. When I say God is sovereign, what does that mean to you? He's in control? Yeah? Yeah. He is the ruler of the universe, right? His authority is total and absolute. He presides over every event under heaven, every moment in every person's life, many of those which Solomon lists in verses 2 through 8. That word sovereign in and of itself, that only speaks to authority, uh, not necessarily the character of the person who rules or how a person may go about exercising his sovereignty. More on that in a minute. Then in verses 2 through 8, Solomon lists 14 events in life and their opposites. Solomon uses a multiple of seven, uh, which is often used in Scripture to indicate completeness. He starts with birth and death for the same reason. And the use of opposites here is a poetic device that includes not only those two events, but also everything in between. Uh, what we're going to do before we look at these closer, verses 2 through 8, to get context, I think it's helpful to, to continue on verses 9 through 11. So we're going to come back to 2 through 8. So verse 9 and 10, he says, What profit is there to the worker from that in which he toils? I have seen the task which God has given the sons of men which to occupy themselves. Uh, if you've been coming uh, these past couple weeks, those verses should sound familiar to you. He said them before. Let's compare. First, let's note how Solomon, he does exclude the phrase under the sun here, perhaps denoting a change in perspective. Verse 9 is a restatement of chapter 1, verse 3. 
What advantage does man have in all this work which he done, does under the sun? Do you remember the answer that he gave to that one? Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. All right. He uses these same phrases at the end of chapter 2 that we just read in verses 22 and 23. And what was the conclusion in those verses? This too is vanity, right? In, in verse 10, he uses the word task. We've seen that before. Listen to how he's described task up to, up to this. Ber chapter 1, verse 13. It is a grievous task which God has given to the sons of men. Chapter 2, verse 23. All his days, his task is painful and grievous. 2.26. To the sinner he has given the task of gathering and collecting. So here, the negativity around that word seems to be removed, and Solomon doesn't use the words grievous and painful. So again, maybe Solomon is changing his perspective a bit. So let's parallel this passage with chapter 1. So again, we, Solomon asks the same question as in 1 verse 3 in verse 9. Uh, and, then chapter, and then verse 10, he repeats a comment he made in verse 13 of chapter 1. It's a grievous task which God has given to the sons of men to be afflicted with. It's almost like he's setting us up for the same disappointment. <laughs> Because in verse 14, right after that, it says, I've seen all the works which have been done in the sun, and behold, all is vanity and striving after wind. But here, what, what conclusion does Solomon provide? He has made everything beautiful in its time. The New American Standard Bible uh, translates that word be beautiful. It doesn't use beautiful. It says appropriate. Uh, Solomon uses that word 17 times. And 14 of those occur in the Song of Solomon. Now, how do you think that word's translated in the Song of Solomon? Beautiful, right? <laughs> we, know the, the, we know the text, uh, the context of so Song of Solomon. He uses this word, verse, uh, word one time in Proverbs. Proverbs. Listen to this. Proverbs 11.22 says, Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman who shows no discretion. Well... <laughs> I tell you, Solomon's illustrations are unparalleled. Uh, he's really good. So, Solomon here provides a new conclusion, and what a different perspective. Instead of all this vanity, or all things are wearisome under the sun, with God in the picture, everything is appropriate or beautiful in its time. The verse, this verse and the verses we just read demonstrate God's providence. Pastor Chris talked about God's providence this morning. God's providence is how He rules, how He accomplishes His sovereign purposes. Remember that all of God's attributes act in harmony together at all times. So while God is sovereign, at the same time, He's also love. He's just, eternal, omnipotent, omniscient, immutable. God accomplishes His purposes in His time and in His way. Uh, Pastor Chris recently preached on the life of Joseph. That's a great example for us. His life was full of opposites, extreme highs and extreme lows. We know he was sold into slavery in Egypt by his own brothers. Then he was falsely accused of attempting to rape his master's wife, and he was thrown into prison. But then he interpreted a dream for Pharaoh about an upcoming famine, and he was appointed a ruler over Egypt. Pharaoh told Joseph, Though I am Pharaoh, yet without your permission, no one shall raise his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. In God's providence, he led the same brothers that sold him into slavery to Joseph in Egypt to do what? To buy food amidst the same famine that Pharaoh dreamed about and Joseph interpreted. God is playing chess, right? <laughs> After revealing his identity to his brothers, do you remember what Joseph told them? <clears throat> he said, It was not you who sent me here, but God. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. You know the rest of the story that Jacob, Joseph's father, moved his family to Egypt, and the Hebrews remained there for 400 years. The nation of Israel was established, and as Pastor Chris is preaching on now, Moses led them out. Uh, did, so did Joseph look back on the difficulties, injustices, and trials he experienced with regret and bitterness? 
or rather humility, gratitude, and exhilaration that God allowed him, a part, uh, allowed him to play a part in his sovereign will, that God used him to accomplish his purposes. Joseph recognized that God makes everything beautiful in its time. In a similar way, God accomplishes his will in our lives through ups and downs, through opposites, through the moments that Solomon mentions in verses 2 through 8. Uh, Chris Bullock taught on John chapter 10 just before uh, this class. And at Chris's first class, he looked at John chapter 9 to give us context for John chapter 10. And John chapter 9 is about Jesus healing a blind man. I'm going to read the first three verses. It says, He, Jesus, passed by. He saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? And Jesus answered and said, it was neither that this man sinned, nor his parents, but why? It was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. I remember Nick uh, making a comment during that lesson, very wise words. He said, do you think the blind man's perspective of his condition changed when he heard Jesus say that his blindness was so that the works of God might be displayed in him? May we have the same attitude about the difficulties in our life. Our lives, each and every moment, fall within the purview of a loving and sovereign God. And what grace that He invites us to share in His will. I'll ask you, how does the idea of a sovereign, loving God make you feel? Does it cause fear? No. Some people it might, right? How does it make you feel? Confident. Confident, yeah. Protected, that's great. Yeah. At peace. Loved, yeah. At peace, Frank. Think of us beyond human comprehension. Yeah. No beginning, he has no end. Yeah. 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 Forever. When do you stop to quit the earth? What time? Right. If you always hear. Yeah. And a human mind, we just can't picture it. Yeah. Forever. I feel uh, relief. <laughs> it's not on my shoulders, right? Uh, I don't have to worry about figuring everything out, about having all the answers. Um, I, I find all that in God and I trust Him with it. Need. What's that? Need. Need, oh, needed, yeah. I don't know if he needs us, but, <laughs> but we need him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, that's right. What grace. Yeah, yeah, good. So does, does thinking about that, uh, you know, that the world is not just meaningless chaos, that there is order and there is purpose. Does that help us follow Solomon's advice to enjoy life? Yeah, we can kind of breathe a little bit, <laughs> relax. There is hope, right? Uh, for Christians, uh, we trust in the work of Christ for our forgiveness, right? Not our own work. And that gives us freedom, freedom to obey God and enjoy life unto His glory because we no longer fear uh, condemnation. I like thinking about um, the two different interpretations of that, uh, or translations of that word, beautiful or appropriate. <clears throat> you know, how does, how does using appropriate influence our uh, interpretation of, um, of verse 11? He has made everything appropriate in his time. What does that suggest? It all fits together. Yeah, yeah. right, right. Yeah, it's not as if, you know, we don't look at it in, as if we are the ones who determine what's appropriate. We look at it as we recognize God's hand and see that it is appropriate. And what if we use the other word? He has made everything beautiful in its time. How does that influence the way we feel about, about it? Perfection. Yeah. Yeah, I think you can use both of those words. When we see glimpses of God, His nature, His power, His sovereignty, 
the results are more than appropriate. <laughs> They're overwhelmingly beautiful. Praise God. Any thoughts on that? We're actually out of time. <laughs> no, it worked out just right. Well, you've been telling us that you've been getting some good news. I think you got it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've been, I've been looking forward to this one. <laughs> Nick. Are you coming back next week to verses uh, uh, 2 through eight? Yes, that's my plan. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wanted to get through verse 11 just to give better context for those. I had a comment, but I'll say this. Perfect. <laughs> I'll remember that. I'll call on you first. Are you going to play the song before you? <laughs> uh, you know, if Mary Catherine was up here, maybe she'd sing it for you, but I won't, I won't torture you uh, with mine. So that's what we'll do next week. Uh, we'll come back and, and look at verses 2 through 8 in more detail, and then uh, continue on through the end of chapter 3. Hollis? I'm thinking about that uh, song. I can't think of it lyrics, but he, he makes all things beautiful in his time. Mm -hmm. Ray Stevens. Ray Stevens. Ray Stevens. Hmm, I don't know. <laughs> he said Ray Stevens. No. I didn't think so. <laughs> in his time, in his time, he makes all things beautiful in his time. Lord, my life to you I bring a song I have to sing. I got gotcha. you. Is that Bill Gaither? That's not Maybe. Ray Steve. Okay. <laughs> I didn't think so either. Good, good. All right. Um, who wants to close this in prayer this morning? Okay, Chris. Lord, we're thankful to be here this morning. It's such a blessing knowing that you have the big picture. Uh, we have such a limited view on all things that we can know, but there's never a circumstance that we're in, whether it's a good time or bad where we all uh, need to give you honor and glory and recognize your sovereignty and pray to you and be obedient to you. Thank you for this morning and the teaching. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, guys.